Welcome participants to the uh, Path Ahead webinar series. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about measuring the economic impact of front country recreation in rural communities. And that sounds a, a little bit unexciting compared to what is going to happen today. I am sitting down because I'm so excited I would otherwise be jumping up and down. So uh, this, this episode is going to be um, really exciting to talk very generally about um, the net, how we measure economic impact of front country recreation. We all talk about it, we all know it anecdotally, but we're going to get a little bit deeper into how we do that in, at the local level. So with that, uh, next slide. Little um, little housekeeping. Uh, we'll answer questions at the end, but feel free to either use the Q and A or the chat box if you have um, questions. We will get to those at the end. If you have technical difficulties, you can text four zero six two zero zero eight two four zero for some assistance. Um, and next slide. Wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the background of this series. Um, it came about because we, uh, the former director of the Office of Outdoor Recreation, um, Rachel Schmidt, and I realized that there aren't a lot of um, get, get granular topics and episodes to be able to, to help people uh, in the front country and the front lines of front country get great recreation done. Um, we have amazing assets, but you know, getting getting good, sustainable, quality recreation on the ground is is sometimes pretty hard. Whether it's parks, trails, uh, boat access, uh, but they're the lifeblood of our communities. So that's why we started this series. Next, this episode is sponsored by Glacier Bank. Um, Glacier has bank, uh, particularly Glacier Bank in Flathead, has been extremely supportive of trails and recreation both in terms of uh, financial contributions and also boots on the ground volunteers. So thank you Glacier Bank for sponsoring this episode. Next. All right, every, um, every episode, I try to focus on the key building blocks for um, sustainable high quality outdoor recreation access in the front country. Um, this episode, will focus number, I usually choose one, but this one I'm gonna choose three, which is planning, funding, and operations and ma uh, maintenance and management. You might not think that economic modeling would affect both funding and o and but it absolutely does. And you'll see why. Next slide. So the key takeaways today are, we're gonna look at, at better managing, planning, and funding outdoor recreation by measuring it more accurately. We're gonna learn from Whitefish Legacy Partners how they've used trail data and uh, outdoor recreation data to increase funding, guide management, plan for the future, um, how data has influenced management decisions and future growth. And most excitingly, we're gonna learn about very innovative, very novel methods of collecting that data beyond the traditional way of installing trail counters. I think this type of research is a game changer and that's why I'm so excited about what we're gonna talk about today. Next slide. So our guests are uh, Megan Lawson, who is an economist at Headwaters Economics. And I think of her as spinning straw into gold. She can take data and turn it into gold for communities and uh, outdoor recreation, fostering outdoor recreation and, and support in the community. And we have Heidi Van Everen, who's the executive director of Whitefish Legacy Partners with Alan Myers Davis, the, who's the development director, who we're gonna talk about the very practical applications about the, um, the impact that the research that Headwaters Economics has done on economic impact modeling have helped them. With the, with the project. Next slide. All right, real quickly, um, this is the reason we're all here. 
this is the relevance. Um, outdoor recreation is at the center of health, economy, and quality of life. Economically, um, this is 2.1% of the GDP in our country. Uh, Montana's GDP, it's the percentage is the third highest in the nation. Next. Quality of life, uh, it's the number one reason that tech leaders give for doing business in Montana. Easy access to public lands is an essential part of quality of life, along with livable communities, stunning scenery, and great recreational opportunities. Next. And health, it's obvious, and it's even, even more obvious during the time of COVID, but we are getting outside, we're exercising outside, we're socializing outside, critically important for our healthy kids. Um, the nature, experiencing nature and getting a nature fix outside is also extremely important um, for, for health and wellness for individuals and communities. Next. So what we're gonna talk about today is how outdoor recreation translates into dollars and jobs at the federal, state and local levels and how those economic projections drive on the ground planning, funding and management impacts. I, I think relevance and impact are both very important attributes for research. Um, we've all heard of shelf art. Um, this research, research and reports that end up on a shelf, this type of research and this innovative methods are really have the potential to make a real difference on the ground. And that's what we'll dive into today. Next. Very briefly, we could do a whole episode on this, but the way that outdoor recreation, the economics of uh, outdoor recreation economy is quantified at the federal level is that the, the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis has developed three, type, three categories of recreation. One is conventional recreation, which is recreational activities that are basically nature-based. Um, they're when we get outdoors and do things. Others are core, other core activities like gardening and outdoor concerts. So maybe not directly outdoor recreation, but outdoor recreation related. And then supporting outdoor recreation. Uh, that's examples of construction, travel and tourism and government spending. In total, that number is four point, four, almost $460 billion annually. Next. So the types, you can see the types, maybe you've probably seen this slide before, but, um, but we'll use it over and over. It's camping, it's motorcycling, it's, it's boating, it's water sports. It's all of those types of activities. And this, this economic analysis at the federal level quantifies the dollars that are spent consumer spending and then also looks at next slide the industry sectors that are affected by that so it's it's arts it's manufacturing it's um, wholesale it's construction so it 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 correlates those types of, of expenditures and those types of products with the federal industry sectors federal industry sector. And in the last two years, that equates to 5.2 million jobs in the country, which is extremely significant. Next slide. At the state level, um, we, Montana has a very, is, uh, the outdoor recreation economy is a very significant component of Montana's um, GDP, um, gross domestic product. $2.5 billion contribution to, which is 4.7% of Montana's GDP. And my, Megan might even have some other factoids that are, that are fascinating about that, but it's very significant. In fact, our, we are third in the nation for the percentage that outdoor recreation plays in our economy. That equates to um, 31, uh, almost 32,000 jobs. And um, the data sh is showing that the, the wages associated with those jobs are on the rise. Next. At the local level, it's a little tougher. 
Um, with the University of Montana did a study with in Helena that looked at the economic impact of their trail system and Headwaters Economics, which we'll hear from today, did a, an analysis that showed that um, $6.1 million locally is generated every year. And the way that that is calculated at the local level is really important for all the reasons you're gonna hear about. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Megan, to lead us through this incredibly novel research that you're that you're just released, hot off the press. So take uh, it away. Next right. slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk about why we need to actually count outdoor recreation and how we tackled it in whitefish for that uh, 2017 study that um, Dan just flashed up and how we're continuing to innovate around how best to count recreation. Um, after I talk about kind of our, what we're calling 1.0, um, I'll hand it over to Heidi and Alan to talk about how they've used this information um, in their work. And then I'll talk about some new methods that we're developing um, to enable land managers, trail advocates, and others to estimate counts of recreation that are timely, accurate, and less expensive, most importantly. Uh, next slide, please. But before I dive into all of that, I just want to give you a little spiel about us. Um, so Headwaters Economics is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization. Um, we're based in Montana, and our mission is to improve community development and land management decisions. Um, we do this by providing research and information and data to help communities make well-informed decisions. Um, we help communities tackle some of the most pressing, pressing issues um, that they have related to socioeconomic change and land use, um, like managing outdoor recreation, energy development, climate related disasters like wildfire and flooding, and equity and economic development. And Headwaters Economics and Whitefish Legacy Partners came to work together, um, kind of it was, a pretty organic process. We learned about each other's work through conferences and just kind of the Montana grapevine. Um, and over the course of many conversations and probably a couple beers with Heidi, uh, we started learning more about what each other was up to. And we started to see a real synergy between the research skills that Headwaters has and Whitefish Legacy Partners strategic needs. Um, so in 2017, we work together to estimate the economic impact of outdoor recreation um, and the Whitefish Trail on the community of Whitefish. And we keep looking for opportunities and excuses to work together and collaborate on presentations and, um, and new work. Okay, next slide. So why do we need better strategies to count recreation? Um, Anecdotally, we hear from recreation managers that the best estimates that they have of how much recreation is happening is the number of shiny new tents that people are getting tangled up in at campgrounds, um, the volume of toilet paper um, being used at trailhead outhouses, and the number of doggy poop bags um, that are used every month. And we think we can do better than this. Um, so we know, as Diane um, showed in those the introductory slides, outdoor recreation is big and it's growing. Um, thanks to that uh, data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, we have really good data at the national and state levels. But as she mentioned, local data is harder to come by. Um, but we don't have a great understanding for exactly where this recreation is occurring and how much there is. So unlike commodities like oil and gas or timber, recreation isn't easily measurable in barrels of oil or board feet of lumber. And it's especially difficult to count recreation when trailheads are remote or if there's an entire trail system with many different access points like on the Whitefish Trail. Next slide, please. So 
So why do we need to count? Um, why do we need to know how much outdoor recreation is happening? Well, first of all, without accurate information, it's difficult to make a case for funding for recreation. Um, so this chart shows visits, recreational visits, and recreational budget for the Forest Service nationally from 2007 to 2017. As, in this, as you can see over that time period, the visits went up by 5% and the budget went down by 14%. And similar patterns are also true at the BLM. So we need to know this information, first of all, to make a case for funding. We also wanna help agencies and organizations like legacy partners better manage recreation so they can better plan for and anticipate use rather than reacting to um, overflowing pit toilets. Um, so when a community understands the magnitude of outdoor recreation, they're better able to capitalize on the economic opportunity and to manage its economic impact. And Heidi and Alan will talk a bunch more about that. Next slide, please. So traditionally, there are two ways that we count recreation. The first method is surveys. So people at trailheads with clipboards and iPads asking people questions and counting the number of people who are on the trail. Federal agencies um, do surveys regularly, um, like the Forest Service National Visitor Use Monitoring Survey that's done every five years on every Forest Service unit. It provides a lot of really helpful detailed information and good estimates um, of the counts. But the fact that it's every five years makes it really difficult to understand emerging uses and really responsive trends. The second method that we use are trail counters. Like in this picture that in that little red circle is a infrared trail counter that we had set up on the Whitefish Trail in 2017. These do give us really timely and pretty accurate detail in the locations where those counters are installed, but it gets expensive to install counters in lots of locations. Um, so together, these give us pretty good counts, but they're expensive and time consuming. Next slide, please. So in Whitefish in 2017, um, to estimate those economic impacts, we started with, we had four trail counters and we installed them all summer at trailheads along the Whitefish Trail. But because the Whitefish Trail has more access points than we had trail counters, we partnered with Strava, which is a fitness tracking app. And from them, we obtained the identified data. So all that means is that we couldn't tell exactly where one person was on any given day. Um, what we could see was how many trips were occurring on a given trail segment on any given day. So we then calculated the share of use at each of the four trailheads that was accounted for by Strava users. So for example, at Lion Mountain, we knew that about 1% of total users were also Strava users. And that ranged from 1% to 6%. So we then used those ratios to estimate use at Whitefish Mountain Resort and in Haskell Basin, where we didn't have trail counters installed, but the folks at Whitefish were really interested in understanding how much use was happening in those key areas. So this gave us a really nice snapshot in time for the summer of 2017. We then combined that information with trailheads at surveys, so people that were out there um, with iPads asking questions, to understand the share of uh, users who were visiting from out of town and how much folks those folks were spending. And with that information combined with accounts, we're able to calculate the economic impact. Next slide, please. So this did, as I mentioned, give us a really detailed snapshot for what was happening in 2017. We're able to answer how many users were on the Whitefish Trail how many users were in other areas and what was the total economic impact um, from all, the, all that trail use. And we combine that information um, to create this dashboard that this is just a screenshot of it, um, but that dashboard is uh, to find out exactly how much use is happening on the different trailheads, day of the week when trail use is happening, if that was bikes or pedestrians. So we got a really rich, um, 
portrait of what was happening with trail use. And also from the survey data, we learned a lot about the role that the Whitefish Trail plays in locals' quality of life. So we didn't just focus on um, how this trail was helping economically. We also dug into the quality of life questions. And so with that, I will turn it over to Heidi and Alan to talk more about the details of what we learned and how they're using it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide again. Great. So Whitefish Legacy Partners, I think I just want to give you a little background to start and um, explain a little bit what front country recreation is for us um, in that, you know, living in Northwest Montana, um, our community is surrounded, um, you know, we surround Whitefish Lake. And then um, to the north of the community, we have Whitefish Mountain Resort, um, Big Mountain. And then um, we have, you know, Glacier Park to the east. And we basically um, connect from Whitefish Mountain Resort sort of up to Canada. So, you know, we are, um, you know, we, we definitely recognize our opportunity to sort of capitalize on this growth of front country recreation. Um, but our project really started as a community driven um, recreation asset. You know, we wanted to create a trail system on the lands around our community for the community. Um, and it was only after sort of the early years of developing the Whitefish Trail um, that we realized that this project that started as a community driven project really had um, a huge economic value and would be able to contribute so much more to the community than just providing a high quality recreation asset. Um, so as Megan mentioned, you know, when we listened to different presentations from Headwaters and Economics, you know, it really started to trigger in our heads, you know, what this could be for us and how maybe there'd be an opportunity for us to work with Headwaters to better understand um, how the two um, can actually work together. Next slide. Great, so this shows a map. I just wanted to, um, you know, talk a little bit about, so our community of whitefish um, is surrounded by 13,000 acres of state lands that's managed by the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation. Um, you can see it on this map in blue and some in purple as well. Um, so these lands that are managed by the DNRC, um, they are known as school trust lands. So they're part of what we were given, you know, part of the Enabling Act um, back in 1889 or somewhere thereabouts. Um, and so each one of these lands is managed on behalf of um, the schools and universities of Montana, and the state is required to ensure that revenue is generated from those lands to support the schools and universities. So as a community, you know, the community values those lands for public access. Um, and have been using those lands for recreation for years. Um, but it's also important that the state has a method of generating revenue from those lands. Um, the lands are managed primarily for timber in our areas, you know, in Eastern Montana, they're often, um, you know, there's different uses, ag lands here, we're focused on timber. Um, but so in the early 2000s, we had to, you know, there was some different ideas of how those lands could generate revenue for the schools. And um, the community came together with different partners, including the DNRC, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, um, the city of Whitefish was instrumental and the local community and businesses as well, um, trying to come up with solutions and ideas of how we could help the state to generate revenue from these lands as a way to ensure that these public lands would be forever an asset to the community. Um, so one of the things that came out of that that Diane was instrumental in and um, numerous of folks in our community was the development of a 20 year land use plan that basically committed all the partners to work together. Um, 
the plan lined out conservation goals, recreation goals, and then over time was expanded to include education and stewardship um, as sort of the foundation of the success of the project. Next slide. So now here we are sort of in 2021, we have um, made immense progress and have had a hugely successful project. Um, we have strong partnerships. We're 80 percent complete with this vis community's vision to develop a 55 mile loop trail that went around Whitefish Lake that's now known as the Whitefish Trail. Um, we've been able to meet many, um, I think all of the 10 and 20 year goals that were established in this land use plan that's known as the Whitefish Area Neighborhood Plan. Um, we are successfully providing revenue to the state and the schools and universities. Um, and you can see on this map, the purple, um, shows all the lands that we've in partnership been able to protect around our community. Um, so, and, and the trail is shown in green. So it has proven itself to be, you know, an incredible economic driver that we never imagined um, would be possible. So, um, we knew anecdotally though, that the trail was providing us economic value because we could tell that visitors were coming to our community more. Um, they were staying for longer. We knew they were spending more money um, it, downtown just because we could feel them on our sidewalks. Um, and we knew that they were out on the trail because the trail kept becoming bigger, I mean, busier and busier, but we didn't have any proof. You know, we just sort of suspected it. So, um, Next slide. Um, but so I think, you know, this was at the point where we realized, okay, we really need to figure out how to quantify um, what's happening out on the trail. And we contacted Headwaters Economics and um, realized that there was an opportunity to work together. And um, here, I think I'll hand it over to Alan to talk more specifically about the actual study and the work that we did together. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, next slide, please. So as Megan mentioned, we did this uh, really extensive economic impact study. Uh, the data was collected in 2017, and then we published in 2018. Uh, 1,800 surveys, for those of you in kind of that statistical world, that's a really strong data set. Um, so the surveys were collected at trailheads, around town, at gas stations. And uh, you know the, the big takeaway that we wanna talk about today is people coming to our community for outdoor recreation, um, whether they're going to Glacier Park, you know, they're coming here to go fly fishing, mountain biking on the Whitefish Trail, et cetera, is they spend more time here and they spend significantly more money here. Um, and so Megan at, and the team at Headwaters was able to do some pretty um, complicated economic modeling and out popped this number. Um, so they came up with this huge number that the Whitefish Trail generates $6.4 million in consumer spending in our community every single year. Um, you know, we're a town of 7,500 people and that is a real number, especially if you look over time, the trail's been out in the landscape now for 10 years. So now we're, you know, we're over $60 million in local impact that, that is ongoing. Um, and that translates to 68 local jobs. So the next step, data did, uh, Megan did some more kind of analysis and we talk about this idea of return on investment, right? I, I have written about this economic impact study in every grant uh, that we have participated in since 2018. Every partner meeting, every donor meeting, I'm talking about that 6.4 million per year. But I think it's really important as a nonprofit to talk about return on investment, right? A lot of these um, <clears throat> donors, the grantors, they're savvy. They want to see uh, in that language how their contribution to our project is having a local impact. And what we found out is every dollar that's been invested uh, to develop the Wipers Trail. Uh, ongoing O&M, easement purchases, I mean, the whole kit and caboodle, every dollar that's been put into this trail project has yielded $2.50 um, in earned income in our community. So, you know, we knew all this was happening, like Heidi mentioned, but now we actually have hard data to back it up. And, um, and it's been hugely impactful for our organization. So you can go to the next slide. Headwaters, uh, luckily and amazingly let us keep three of the trail counters. Um, they are expensive, 
but we've been able to uh, to collect data since that kind of 1.0 economic impact study. And what we found, we didn't really have um, an anticipation of this benefit, but it's impacted our planning, our management and long-term funding. So just wanted to go over a quick snapshot of how it's impacted our long-term planning. Uh, Lion Mountain is our busiest trailhead by far. It's right close to town. We have had a trail counter on, on the same tree there for almost five years. And so uh, what we knew is trail use is increasing, right? That's no surprise. Now we can actually start looking at, at trends and it gives us some predictability. So we can say, okay, the hypothesis is trail use at Lion Mountain is kind of getting to that breaking point where we're gonna need to expand trails or potentially expand the parking lot. Well, let's look at the data. So, you know, average 12 year, 12% 12 growth over the next 10 years. And we're gonna have a quarter million people at a trailhead that only uh, can hold 15 cars. That's not possible. So, you know, that told us we need to jump on this planning um, right now. The other thing that was interesting is we said, okay, well, maybe if we build other trails surrounding our community, the pressure is going to come offline mountain a little bit. Well, we opened the Haskell Trail on the other side of town. It's five and a half miles um, with two trailheads and and trail use at Lime Mountain didn't go down. It didn't even like skip a beat. It just kept going up. And especially last year with COVID. Um, so that kind of told us no matter what we do, trail use at Lyon is going to keep going up. The other thing that we did is we put a trail counter on the exit trail at Lyon Mountain. And we found out that people that come there, they stay at Lyon Mountain. Two thirds of trail users, they want that close to town experience either before work, during lunch, after work. You know, there's a close destination uh, at a mile and a half. There's a great overlook. And so people are staying there. The conclusion that the data kind of drove was that we need to start planning now. Putting an actual trail on the ground is a very long process of planning design, you know, getting permissions from the landowner, in this case, the DNRC, uh, doing an environmental assessment, et cetera, and, uh, and then fundraising and actually building the thing. So we put it in our budget this year to uh, start planning for this expansion, knowing that we're not going to get trails on the ground for four to five years. Next slide. So the uh, ongoing management of the trail system, this was pretty interesting. We, I mentioned we, we opened that new Haskell trail um, and it's five and a half miles of, town, of trail that connect our community up to Whitefish Mountain Resort for those of you that don't know. So you can literally ride a bike uh, or, or trail run or hike from the summit of Big Mountain, you know, 14 miles on single track and drop 4,000 feet right, right down to the local brewery. Uh, it's a pretty amazing experience. And, the hypothesis that we've gotten out of this is that downhill mountain bikers are ruining, you know, that experience. We've got increased user conflicts and that might lead to future management decisions. So uh, we've had a trail counter on that trail now. Uh, we've got two years of complete data. And I really wanted to look at what's the proportion of downhill users, um, which luckily these trail counters tell us direction of travel, which is pretty amazing. And so in 2019, 60% of the traffic was moving downhill and 40% was moving uphill. We felt like as an organization, that's, that's right where it should be. That's pretty acceptable. Uh, we know people are shuttling it, not just for bikes, but also for hiking. Um, and so last year saw a huge increase in overall trail use. 55% more people in Haskell uh, than the, the year before. And I think that led to some of that anecdotal evidence of people calling us and just saying it, it just feels busier, but they're blaming it on the mountain bikers. So we were really happy to see in 2020 that that proportion of downhill to uphill traffic was remaining the same um, at 60% to 40%. So the data told us, okay, we need to increase our outreach. We need to call out mountain bikers specifically with increased signage on the trail but we don't need to do anything drastic right now. We're just gonna keep monitoring it and see how it goes. If it gets to be in that 75% down and 25% up, then we might have to consider, okay, mountain bikes only allowed on these certain days or, or something like that. So it's been pretty, uh, pretty cool to see how this has impacted our management. Next slide. So when we talk about um, long-term funding, what the data has done for us is push this idea that maintenance has a direct correlation to our, uh, or sorry, trail use has a direct correlation to our maintenance costs. So as trail use goes up, our maintenance costs goes up. We've been able to, our program director, uh, Margosha Jadkowski, she 
developed a 20 year maintenance budget for our project. And I think that's unheard of across the state. Um, and so we've been able to talk to partners to say, okay, the Wyvis Trail is, is a city owned asset. How are we gonna plan for trail use 20 years from now when, when trail use is expected to be you know, this much, especially when half that trail use in the summer is coming from tourism and, and visitors. So in Whitefish, we're really lucky. We have a resort tax on non-essential goods and services. So if, if you go to the hardware store and buy a hammer, you're not getting taxed. If you go to Montana Tap House and get a beer, you are getting taxed. Um, the current ballot language and, and the revenue supports uh, property tax relief for local residents, capital improvement projects for parks and public works, and it pays for uh, the development rights for a conservation easement in Haskell Basin. The downfall of the current uh, language is it doesn't uh, allow for maintenance expenses. I mean, I think, you know, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So, you know, talking about uh, increased maintenance costs is huge for the next allocation that's coming up here in 2025. Similarly, we have that $6.4 million in economic impact. We can literally take 3% of that and say, okay, the Wyvis Trail is now generating $190,000 in resort tax revenue. Like we need a fraction of that money to help us manage it because every local business, you know, the tourism industry, they're promoting our outdoor infrastructure. They're saying people in Florida come to Montana, use our trails but there's no kind of direct feedback loop to have those people help us pay for the maintenance of those very trails that we're promoting. Um, and so again, we're lucky in Whitefish, we have this, the data has created a very clear and understandable conversation surrounding that. And over the last five years, you know, conversations with city councilors, the mayor, uh, there's a resort tax steering committee, community leaders, we have uh, proposed a 2% of the total resort tax revenue will directly support wide distro maintenance. Um, and it's gonna be on the November 2021 ballot uh, as a ballot measure. And we are just pumped that uh, we've finally gotten to this point. Next slide. The last thing I wanna mention is the data has kind of influenced our, our community engagement outreach messaging. Like I, I mentioned, it, it has pushed maintenance to the forefront of how we talk about the Whitefish Trail. Um, but also we were able to create an event. May, the data showed that we had this huge spike in trail use in May, right? We've all lived in the Flat Valley for a gray winter. We wanna get outside. Um, and so we wanted to, to create an event that promotes health and wellness. It converts trail users to donors. So we came up with this idea to do the Hit the Trail Challenge. It was modeled off of a similar program in Bozeman, but um, every mile that's logged on the trail during the month of May is matched with a dollar donated back to the project. Uh, we've been able to work this messaging into our fundraising um, and, and talk about it. It is so important, uh, especially if we talk about the Wives Trail and those long-term uh, kind of conversations that we want to keep this resource available uh, to us in the future, to our kids in the future, and to the visitors you know, that want to have the same experiences that we have today. So that's all I have. Uh, next slide is just a really nice picture of the Haskell Trail, as I mentioned. And then I'm going to hand it back to Megan, and she's going to talk about um, the meat of uh, her study. Okay. Thanks, Ellen. Um, next slide, please. So jetpacks. That's why Diane is so excited. Sorry. Um, not really, but um, so. Uh, Alan just talked about some of the great things that they've been able to do with this research um, from 2017, and we're super proud of the work that we did and even more psyched with what they've been able to do with it since then. Um, but we wanted to see if we could use what we learned. Um, we headwaters could use what we learned um, from that 2017 research, build on it, and Test methodologies that could be used to count recreation cost effectively in more places. So the focus of our new research was to investigate a range of what we call novel data sources. So these are data from apps and websites that um, maybe weren't originally designed to count recreation, but researchers have learned how to take advantage of that data to use to apply to a whole host of things, including ways to count recreation. So some examples include fitness tracking apps like Strava, 
um, also social media apps like Twitter and Instagram and cell phone um, GPS data. Next slide, please. Okay, so we had two main goals for this research um, in the 2.0 version. Um, the first was to see if we could expand beyond just that snapshot in time to forecast use so recreation managers can plan proactively. Next slide, please. Our second goal was to see if we could, because um, that 2017 research was a lot of detail in one location. We wanted to see if we could predict use in other locations with little to no in-person on the ground counts to make this information more accessible to more people with enough data, um, enough detail to still make well-informed decisions. Um, as our, our aim across all of these improvements is to make counting recreation more cost-effective in a wider range of locations. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna walk you through the statistical model we developed to estimate use. Um, I'm just kidding, Can you, next slide. I don't want everyone to fall asleep. Um, so, but I just wanted to let you know that is what underlies um, this analysis that we did. But what you do need to know is that we used inputs from two novel data sources. So we continued our partnership with Strava and we also wanted to test drive Google Trends data, um, which is basically a measure of how frequently people are searching, are using a certain search term. So in this case, we use the search term whitefish trail. We combine these two novel data sources with data about weather and time of year to develop a highly accurate statistical model to estimate trail use. Okay, next slide, please. So this chart shows actual use from the infrared counters. Like Alan mentioned, we've had that one counter um, stuck on a tree for going on five years now. Um, the actual data from the counter is in orange compared to our model's predictions, which are in dark blue for the Lion Mountain Trailhead. So because we have that trail counter data, we can measure how accurately our model is predicting use. So if we just look at the predictions for weekly totals, um, our model predicts within 10% of the actual use if we look at the annual prediction, so how many trail uses are happening over the whole year, the model predicts within 2% of actual use. So we're really pleased with how accurately um, this model is predicting. And then to look forward in time, uh, so from 2021 to 2024, um, through 2024, we applied that statistical model and the annual growth rate that's included in that to predict future use. And so the light blue bands, hopefully they're coming up um, on your screen. In the future, it shows the 95% confidence intervals. So this is the range of use within which we're 95% certain that actual future use will fall somewhere in that range. So the model forecasts that peak use will hit nearly 4,900 users um, by 2024. And that's a more than 100% increase from 2017. Um, and that's a weekly total. So armed with this kind of information, our goal is for groups like Whitefish Legacy Partners to be able to anticipate and budget for, and like Alan was saying, that having to do that long range planning um, starts now um, for future trailhead capacity and maintenance needs. Next slide, please. So to test our second goal of predicting use in other places, we applied that model that we calibrated at Lion Mountain to estimate use on the Galligator Trail, which is a commuter trail in the heart of Bozeman. Um, so again, actual use is the orange line because there's a, also a long-term uh, infrared trail counter set up here. And then estimated use from the model is the dark blue line. So now it's important to note there are some differences, um, important differences between Lion Mountain and the Galligator. Um, Lion Mountain is more front country recreation and the Galligator is more urban, um, at least by Montana standards. Um, the Lion Mountain is 
pretty much all recreation, whereas the Galligator has also has quite a lot of commuting in, um, on it. And the Galligator has been a long, around for longer, while the Whitefish Trail is relatively new. Um, and so Galligator use isn't growing as quickly as use at the Whitefish Trail is. So this model predicts within 15% um, within of the actual use on the Galligator, which is pretty good, um, but there's certainly room for improvement. So we think that there's strong potential to predict use in other locations, and the model accuracy is really only going to improve once we can start incorporating more different types of trails. Next slide, please. So in summary, our goal for these innovations around recreation counting is first to minimize that need for on the ground counting, whether it's through trail counters or surveys, in-person surveys, so that we can estimate accurate and timely counts across lots of different types of trails front country and back country, rural and urban, motorized and non-motorized, ideally across the US. And ultimately, we'd like to use um, these methods to more efficiently and quickly estimate the economic impacts. So more communities will have um, that kind of information that Whitefish Legacy Partners has been able to leverage. So hopefully with a robust understanding of the volume and the type of recreation that is happening, land agencies can manage that recreation well and communities can capitalize on the economic potential. And we're super excited about this work um, and we're well on our way to really giving this research legs. Um, right now we're expanding um, the research that I just talked about to develop a more robust base model um, because really this was just a proof of concept to see how well these methods and these data could work just using one trail, one trailhead. So we're currently expanding that um, to include different types of trails. Uh, the full report and more details on this and the, that original 2017 report are available on our website, headwateseconomics.org. I know Diane is um, gonna send out some links and I'll put a link in the chat here in a sec. Um, and finally, I have an ask for people. Um, as I mentioned, we're looking to expand our modeling and our analysis, and we're looking for more locations where we can um, continue to tweak and improve upon this model. So if you do have trail counter data um, and don't mind being a guinea pig, please do get in touch with me. Um, and our, my contact information will be at the end of this. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Diane. Unmute. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to go through uh, uh, a couple of the questions that we have, uh, and I, I may have some questions too. Um, thank you, Megan, for um, for including including that research in the chat. Um, what two? Let's see. Let me look at the chat. Okay. Um, we have two questions about the Haskell Basin Trail, and then we have, um, we had a question about the, the trail counters. Um, can you talk a little bit, Megan, about the, or, or Alan, whoever, about the brand and type and expense of, of trail counters? Um, because we, we know they're sort of the, you know, the best, best practice, um, so I think having, having a little data would be good. Yeah, the ones, and there's lots of different types of technologies out there. Um, these are infrared trail counters and um, they're from a company called EcoVisio. Um, and I put a note about it in the chat. Um, and the specific models, these are pyro boxes. Um, and they're good for this type of installation where we need them to be really weather hardy. Um, they also, as Alan mentioned, can tell direction, um, which can be really handy. And they run in the three to $4,000 range a piece. So um, it starts getting pricey quickly if you're trying to put up a lot of them. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, they come with a 10 year battery, which is amazing to me that it can survive, you know, 20 below in the winter time and still function for 10 years. So it is expensive, but if you start looking at it 
as a per year cost, um, I, I think it's worth it. You know, over a 10 year cost, $3,500 is $350 a year. Um, I feel like it's worth it just based on what we've been able to access. And you can download the data really easily with Bluetooth. Um, and they've just come since we've put it on the trees, they've developed apps now for your phone. So uh, you can actually download the data with your phone. Cool. Um, two questions for Alan and Heidi about Haskell Basin. Is there a plan to build a second Haskell Basin trail, separate uphill, downhill traffic? Um, and are they uh, more talk about the monetary costs? You know, if you can answer Haskell Basin quickly, otherwise maybe, um, you know, we can type an answer uh, because our it might not be of immense rel relevance to everyone in the state, but um, go ahead. Yeah, I can just say shortly that we don't have any plans right now to build a second Haskell Trail and if we can talk more about that, but um, the, the maintenance costs, the explicit, like what are we actually spending money on? We do hire a part-time seasonal trail coordinator. So it's, it's personnel time. Um, that person is, you know, this year is gonna be 35 hours a week from May to October. Um, and then, you know, just contracts to clean the trailheads. We have a contractor that goes out to about half our trailheads once a week and line mountain twice a week in the summertime. It's cost to pump all of our vault toilets every fall. Um, it is, uh, you know, tool expenses, but we were lucky that we've developed a tool cash, uh, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, uh, cleaning supplies, and then plowing in the wintertime is a bit, a big expense. I think that kind of hits all the main categories. Heidi, you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I mean, our maintenance budget each year for the trail is just over $40,000. Um, our operations budget is just under $25,000. So, um, you know, we break apart what it costs to operate it versus what it costs to maintain it. Um, you know, that includes, um, you know, what that number doesn't include um, is, you know, all our in-kind donations as an organization that we contribute to the project, um, all the city's in-kind donations that they contribute, you know, and that's personnel and staff time, um, you know, our expertise helping to organize the project, but it also includes, you know, volunteer crews and patrols um, to, you know, oversee and make sure we have eyes and ears on what's happening out there so that we know about trees being down and that sort of thing. So $65,000 a year to operate and maintain the trail. And, and one expense I didn't mention is our license fees to the DNRC. Um, $15,000 a year goes to the state to pay for those licenses. It is not cheap uh, to, to you know, pay for the public's right to recreate on state trust lands. And that's included in my 65 number, but thank you for clarifying, yep. I'll, uh, I'll add a little bit too. Um, I, I don't, uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been involved in this project since before the beginning. Um, as a founder of Whitefish Legacy Partners, and uh, we're still we're still working. And as I tease people, I said, "Yeah, I didn't have this gray hair before before I started." Um, but I also want to say that um, you know a very prescient thing that we were able to do, um, largely because of the um, very generous philanthropic partners that we've had. Um, you know, we started an endowment. Um, we set aside money. Um, parked it with the Whitefish Community Foundation to specifically for maintenance. So it's, um, it's a, a chunk of, of money that um, we're able to allocate toward that budget that Heidi and Alan both talked about. Um, and it really helps, it doesn't cover it all, um, but it really helps offset some of the, some of the funding for maintenance because as we all know, there's money for construction, but there's not a lot of money for maintenance. Um, thankfully, we have a, had a new grant in Montana, the Montana Trails Stewardship Grant to offset that, and, but there just isn't a lot of money for maintenance. And I think it's, it's a um, source of pain for a lot of, of local trail systems. Um, Megan, for you, we have a, a couple of questions about the data, um, Google Trends data about if you could talk a little bit about what Google Trends data is and maybe how Google Trends correlates with Strava data. 
Um, so the Google Trends data, um, there has been research in other places, um, specifically around national parks, um, where they did find a really strong relationship between visitation and how much people were Googling, say, Arches National Park. Um, for this analysis, I did not find a strong relationship between how often people were searching Whitefish Trail and the actual number of uses. Um, I think my primary hypothesis for that is just that the term Whitefish Trail is just a little too generic. So um, people could be searching Whitefish Trail and looking for hiking in Glacier um, or any trail in the broader Whitefish area. So I think um, that data could be, the Google Trends data could be useful for something with a really unusual name um, that gets a lot of visit, like visits like the Slick Rock Trail, say, in um, Moab. Um, and when I looked at comparisons between how uh, Google Trends and the Strava data line up, they are actually really different, um, and they were very strongly correlated. So they're, um, that's why initially I was very excited to include the Google Trends data, thinking that it could be capturing a different type of user. Um, but for the Whitefish Trail, it, um, it didn't really go anywhere, but I think when we're thinking about expanding this to different types of places, um, I still think there is some potential there. Great. Um, well, that's all, our, uh, all the questions that we have. So I, we have uh, four minutes, so I wanna wrap up here. Um, just to let you know, Montana Access Project is, has a couple of uh, events that we're doing. One is, a, I call it Bob Walker's Front Country Watch List. Uh, he, Bob Walker is a longtime follower, uh, former FWP employee and follows Front Country Recreation, um, Front Country Recreation Parks, Trails and Access um, as opposed to, to Habitat and Wildlife. He's followed these, um, this legislation for years and years and years. So we meet every other Thursday. The next one's March 18th, uh, then April 5th, 15th and 29th. And we talk about what's going on in the legislature. There is a lot going on in the legislature right now. Um, some, we just pa passed transmittal, some helpful bills, some not so helpful bills for um, rural communities who are seeking to, um, expand their outdoor recreation economic impact. Um, but we'll be following those as we as we go forward uh, through the end of the legislative session, which is at the end of April. Uh, upcoming, we'll, in, on April 13th, we're gonna hear from Anaconda and the Anaconda Community Foundation. They have a great partnership that has allowed the Anaconda Trail Project to move forward and seek some funding because of this unique relationship between the, um, the Community Foundation and Anaconda Trails. I was interested in this because of, of number one, I think local community foundations are an underutilized resource. And number two, um, Anaconda has been pretty creative about putting a funding package together and a, putting the funding puzzle together to be able to leverage funds, seek grants, and get trail built on the ground in a very small community, uh, very rural, uh, without a lot of, of local government capacity. Um, uh, in May, we'll have, a da we'll have a down low on what happened in the legislature. We'll go through, we'll hear from um, outdoor recreation experts, uh, folks who followed the legislature, maybe a legislator or two, about um, what happened this session for front country and particularly front country recreation in rural communities who are seeking to, to um, expand their economic impact. And then in June, this is my working title, e-bikes are a coming. Um, so in June, we're gonna focus on, there are a couple of bills this legislative session about e-bikes. Um, We'll look at, at what the federal and state policies are, local policies. I know um, Alan and Heidi and I have talked about this quite a bit, um, just from a management standpoint and operations standpoint. Um, 
what happens what happens when when e-bikes are are more prominent pre prevalent than they are now um with with uh other human powered types of uses so uh conflicts opportunities and see what the latest is on that um i think in many ways montana is on the cutting edge of that um we are seeing a lot of increased usage we're seeing a lot of um we're just seeing a lot of activity in that area. So um, next slide. We're out of time. Uh, here are the resources that will be available on the Montana Access Project website. This presentation will be recorded. It is available for you to watch on your own time. We will also include these resources as a, a separate link. The ver this research is very, very hot off the press. I cannot under I cannot understate that, um, overstate that. Uh, this is is brand new stuff. So um, we're hearing about it, and we're privileged to be able to be the beneficiaries of it in Whitefish and the Whitefish Trail. Uh, I also included a link to the Whitefish Economic Report, and I included a link to the Helena uh, Helena Economic Impact Report also for the Helena Trails. So with that, uh, next slide. Uh, we have resources available. Uh, Megan, Megan's email directly. Um, Heidi and and Alan's directly. Myself. You can sign up for Montana Access Project. We do these deep dives every month. Uh, you can join our Facebook group where we talk about pre prescient, prevalent legislative issues and other issues facing uh, front country recreation managers, operators, enthusiasts, and champions. And with that, um, next slide. That's it. So thank you so much and um, join us next month.